I hate war as only a soldier who has lived it can, only as one who has seen its brutality, its stupidity. He came from the heart of America. Dwight David Eisenhower, the kid with the unstoppable spirit, the Texas-born, Kansas-raised boy they called Little Ike, the boy entrepreneur who raised and sold cucumbers and corn, the West Point plebe who saluted a drum major because he was the most decorated fellow he had ever seen, the football playing West Point discipline problem, the second lieutenant who paid for his first uniform with poker winnings, to America, he was the five-star general and the two-term president, and his nation's most beloved hero. To most Americans, he was just Ike, and they liked Ike, Democrats and Republicans. They liked Ike. In Abilene, Kansas, when paving was but a dream and the streets were thick with mud after every rain, young Ike was known to have a fiery temper. Once, when he was 10 years old, he was in trouble at home. He had taken out his anger by beating up an apple tree. Years later, he recalled his mother, Ida, saying, He that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who taketh a city. More than 60 years later, he would look back on that conversation with his mother as one of the most valuable in his life. Young Ike took poker lessons from an older fellow right out of the Wild West. That fellow may have taught Ike poker, but it was life that taught him about gambling. When he was 14, a knee injury and resultant infection put him flat on his back, in and out of a coma. Only an amputation would save his life. In a conscious moment, young Ike spoke firmly, you are never going to cut that leg off. He made his brother Edgar promise to stop any attempt at amputation, saying that he would risk death rather than give up his leg. The angry doctor could not persuade his parents or Edgar to allow the amputation. After two terrible weeks, Ike's health began to return. He lost a year of school, but kept his other options. Had it gone another way, Dwight Eisenhower would have gone through life on an artificial leg, undoubtedly a civilian. Young Ike, at 14 years of age, had gambled with life and death. His parents were pacifists. When Ike got his appointment to West Point, his mother was truly disappointed, but neither his mother nor his father tried to influence his decision. Once there, his vision quickly changed. On the evening of his first day, he was sworn in. He recalled it as a supreme moment. From then on, Ike Eisenhower from Abilene would serve his nation and not himself. For a lifetime, his understanding of a call to duty would grow deeper and stronger. By his second year at West Point, young Eisenhower excelled in football. Some sports reporters said he could become an All-American. A late season knee injury ended his career as a player. From then on, all he could do was coach. Unable to play football, he was tempted to leave the academy. In sports, Ike was a standout. 
In discipline, well, discipline was another matter. Ike had what he called slight differences with the West Point disciplinary code. Looking back on his West Point years, Ike recalled, I enjoyed life at the academy, had a good time with my pals, and was far from disturbed by an additional demerit or two. I never fully reformed. In 1915, Dwight David Eisenhower was commissioned a second lieutenant in the infantry. He graduated 125th in discipline and a class of 164. Academically, he graduated in the top third of his class. Five years after graduation, Eisenhower published an article on tank warfare in Infantry Journal and was hauled before the Chief of Infantry to be told that his ideas were wrong and dangerous, and if he were to publish more of those ideas, he would be court-martialed. Assigned the Panama Canal Zone, Eisenhower became General Fox Connor's friend and student, reading widely under Connor's tutelage. He read Plato and Nietzsche. He read about Grant and Sherman. General Connor predicted that America would be in another world war in 20 years or less. Connor told Ike to prepare for that war by working with General George Marshall, saying that Marshall was a genius who knew more about arranging Allied commands than anyone else. 11 years after graduating from West Point, Dwight Eisenhower, the former discipline problem, the man with the dangerous ideas about tanks, went to the Army's command and general staff school. He graduated first in his class. Two decades later, having commanded the Allied forces in North Africa, he was the supreme commander of the Allied expeditionary forces that were about to invade Normandy by land, by sea, and by air. By early June of 1944, the weather was the overwhelming force that could delay the invasion for weeks. What should Eisenhower think about the weather to come? On June 4th, the storm's fury rose. Eisenhower had carried seven lucky coins since the invasion of North Africa. Now he was rubbing them. Group Captain Dr. John Stagg was a weather specialist on loan from the RAF. Looking into the future, Stagg predicted a brief break in the storm that would allow almost perfect visual bombing weather. In the meeting, two air advisors hedged, while Admiral Ramsey saw satisfactory conditions for naval bombardment. If Eisenhower were to get it wrong, the airborne troops would be grounded, air support would be non-existent, landing craft would sink in the surf, invasion forces would be lost to the weather itself. The earlier Allied invasions of Sicily, North Africa, and Italy had begun in good weather and at dawn. What was he to think about the weather to come? Finally, in the morning meeting with Stagg's prediction in mind, Ike said, 
Okay, we'll go. Three words. Okay, we'll go. With those three words, Eisenhower launched the Normandy invasion. With those three words, in the face of awful weather, he launched the largest armada in the history of the world, an invasion force of 5,000 vessels, giant ones and small ones, some new and some rusting, some fast and some slow, 5,000 vessels that would face the Normandy coast and move in assaulting ranks 20 miles wide. Okay, we'll go. He set in motion 11,000 planes, 18,000 paratroopers, 200,000 men who had been waiting on ships sitting in the tossing seas. With those three words, he rallied the troops who waited, more than a quarter million of them in the embarkation areas. Eisenhower did not like ordering the invasion in bad weather. It was a tremendous gamble. But postponement until July, that he liked even less. For a time, nothing remained but waiting, and Ike would wait with the troops. He would talk with them face to face as casually as he had been doing for months. Standing relaxed, with his hands stuffed into his pants pockets, he talked with the troops of the 101st Airborne, he knew they would soon be making a nighttime jump behind enemy lines. One prediction said that the 101st Airborne could take 70% casualties. When Ike told them not to worry because their leaders and equipment were the best, one sergeant replied, Hell, we ain't worried, General. Ike stayed until the last C-47 was off the runway. Tears filled his eyes. When reports began to come in, it was clear that the deception had worked. The Germans had been intercepting fake signal traffic from non-existent armies preparing to land at Calais. False reconnaissance, false raids near Calais. Even Rommel believed the attack would come there, where the English Channel was narrowest. Even when the first troops hit the beaches at Normandy, some German generals thought they were a diversion. The deception had worked, the weather had broken, and the Allies were moving into Hitler's fortress with a determination the world would never forget. Allied commanders had secretly predicted that 10,000 Allied troops could die in the first days of the Normandy invasion. When final reports came in, the success of the invasion was certain. Ike could throw away the words he had written in preparation for the possibility of a failure. Fewer than 2,500 Allied troops have been killed in the invasion, one quarter of the number anticipated. Ike, the analyst, the patriot, the poker player, the reader, the gambler, had won. It was a remarkable victory. By 1948, 
The memory of the nation's most difficult war was still rich in the American mind. The processes of time that fade details and numb emotions had barely begun. The memories of D-Day and the commander who had engineered the Allied victory were fresh. Many saw Eisenhower as the ideal presidential candidate, but publicly he rejected such ideas. He belonged to the army, he said. The army was an institution that serves the nation and nothing else. No party and no special group. But the time had come for America to elect a new president and another duty to his nation called Dwight Eisenhower. Years earlier, when the war raged in Europe, Ike had stood before young British officers who were about to lead men in battle. He spoke to them of duty, saying that any person, whether he is at the plow in the field or with a gun at the front, then fails to do his full duty, every day, every hour, must forever bear on his own conscience the certainty that he has contributed some incalculable amount to the agony and the anguish our two countries must endure. The nation was again at war, this time in Korea. America faced an age more perilous than any in the history of the world, a nuclear age. Although he really wanted to resist candidacy for the office of president, Ike's personal standards made it impossible to refuse this new and different call to duty. Eventually, he overcame his deep reluctance to be a candidate. When, in the campaign, he spoke on foreign policy, it was obvious that he was tough and capable. He said that he would go to Korea where another awful war was costing the lives of young Americans. It was Eisenhower who could go to Korea and, once there, understand what he was seeing. Probably no head of state in the world would understand the war in Korea better. Six months after taking office, he ended the war. In negotiating a peace in Korea, Eisenhower opposed those on the Hill who wanted an all-out military victory over North Korea. Instead, he threatened the Chinese with the use of nuclear weapons. Ike preferred the world to think that America could fight and survive a nuclear war, but he knew better. There had to be diplomatic measures that were better than threatening nuclear war. Early in his first term, he attacked the arms race. Diplomacy needed to be guided by one goal, the pursuit of peace. He told the American people, every warship launched, every rocket fired signifies in the end a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. The cost of one modern heavy bomber is this, a modern brick school in more than 30 cities. This is not a way of life at all in any true sense. Under the cloud of threatening war, it is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. The 1950s were a time of international change and turbulence. One-time ally, the Soviet Union, had changed their posture. 
In 1955, Ike met with the Russians in Geneva. It was the only way to save the world. When Eisenhower proposed an open skies policy that would allow both countries inspection of the other, Khrushchev refused. For eight years, Eisenhower had maintained peace for America in a world that war could now destroy. He had hoped for more. Rather than slowing the Cold War, he had hoped to reverse it. The more permanent peace he had hoped for had escaped him, and that pained him as he left office. This is what he said. As one who has witnessed the horror and lingering sadness of war, as one who knows that another war could utterly destroy the civilization which has been so slowly and painfully built over thousands of years, I wish I could say that a lasting peace is in sight. At the end of his presidency, his words spoke sadly about the absence of an enduring peace. More than his words, however, his life spoke eloquently to the world. His life spoke of duty, of hope, of courage, of the power of the human spirit, and of peace. He came from the heart of America, and he will forever live there.